Happy Friday, everybody. Mike Sortito here, and we've got another month in the books. April was not a good month for stocks. <clears throat> a, lot of, a lot of stuff was going on, a lot of stuff was happening. I think there was some profit taking. We had the first three months of the year were, were, were great. One of the best months ever, I'm sorry, one, one of the better quarters ever, up about 10.7%. Since then, we saw a bit of a pullback. Uh, I know that might be concerning to many, and we we talked about this I think, a couple of weeks ago that pullbacks are um, they're not they don't feel good, but they're absolutely necessary because if you don't get them, uh, markets go out of control and they tend to spiral, and then you get a 2022 type of event. So we like to see what I call pressure release valves along the way, and that way it create kind of creates a foundation for future growth. So we'll see what happens. Hard to say. But we had a lot going on uh, this week, especially with the Fed meeting. So what came out of the Fed meeting, there were a lot of concerns because of uh, kind of mixed economic data. But uh, basically, the short version is inflation is not going away anytime soon. And that has caused a lot, a lot of the markets to reprice expectations around what is going to happen to interest rates. Thankfully, Jerome Powell, in a rare, I guess, occurrence of sorts, came out and let everybody know, no reason to freak out, no reason to panic just yet. I think it's unlikely that the next policy rate move will be a hike. I'd say it's unlikely. So basically what he has done in Fed speak, which by the way, is harder sometimes to understand than Arabic, but um, in Fed speak, what he's basically telling the world is that, don't worry, we have no intentions of raising interest rates, calm down. And I think what we're starting to see here is a little bit of markets calming since Wednesday's uh, Fed meeting, which they did nothing at, which was widely expected. But a couple, like I said, when we talk about mixed economic data, the first thing I think coming to mind here is we got the number out for the first quarter GDP of this year. Now, it came out at 1.6% after you back out inflation, we call real growth. Now, the expectation was closer to 2.4. So 1.6 is less than 2.4, as we know. And as a result, there were some concerns that the economy is not holding up, there's a concern around spending. Um, that came out right around the time we started getting data back from companies that are in earnings season right now. Okay, so the reporting earnings. Earnings have been fine. Uh, it depends on who you talk to. I think they've been fine. So far, 80% of companies have beat their top line or their revenue estimates, okay? That sounds like a large number, but generally speaking, it's kind of in line. Uh, earnings, about 60% of companies have beat their earnings, so the bottom line, if you back out all the costs for the company. So that's good. Um, and about 52, 53% so far have beat on both the top line and the bottom line, earnings and revenue. So. Earnings are fine right now. Like I said, they're not stellar. And the reason why you might be thinking, well, Mike, you just said 80% of companies beat on the revenue forecast. Well, yeah, but it's also, that's a relative measure. It depends on the forecast. And we have pretty low expectations right now for companies. So that's when I say earnings are fine. They're just been fine. And that's, and that's good. I, I don't mind that. We don't need to see blockbuster earnings out of every company, every quarter to want to invest if anything, I think quarterly earnings are massively overrated and overanalyzed. But that being said, the economy is not growing the way that, we, that, that, that the expectations put it at. Now, just be clear, this data gets revised like three more times. So we won't really know for sure what the actual number is, probably for another year, maybe a little less than that, it just depends. So my, my point with that though, is that GDP, is worth looking at but as we talked before it's a lagging indicator meaning that it, it looks in the past not the future and and looking in the past i think it, it's helpful but it's not predictive and that's what we need to think about is how do we look forward and what we're seeing here is a lot of adjustments in financial markets that's why we see some volatility in april the beginning of april I'll take a step back at the beginning of the year, there were expectations for six to seven rate cuts this year. Now we've talked ad nauseum about how we thought that forecast was way, way too optimistic. You, you never know, but we just, and we didn't know, look, I don't know what's going to happen with interest rates, 
But I that just that just felt like it was a little too optimistic given some of the trends that we were seeing, some of the leading indicators at the time that we were looking at. Now, at the beginning of this, uh, I'm sorry, at the beginning of yeah, beginning of April, those started to shift a little bit, and by the end of the month, what we're seeing now here are what the market expects interest rates to end in 2024 at, which is about 5%, 4.97% in all that chart. Now, currently their target is 5.5%, 5.2 to 5.5. So that indicates probably one rate cut this year. That's what's being baked in. By the end of 2025 on the right-hand side, it drops all the way down to about 4.39%. So a couple more rate hikes next year. It's very, very hard. These, these estimates, by the way, are always wrong. We've talked about this over the years. They're never right. But the reason why we look at them is to get an idea of what's being priced in the markets. I find that to be interesting and sometimes helpful in other ways. So things are changing. And I think when you wrap it all up, what we're seeing here right now is a couple of things. One is that the economy is doing fine right now. Uh, when I say it's fine, it's, it's a mix of some things are not that great. Okay, the jobs report that came out today wasn't great. All right, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't stellar. All right, didn't meet expectations. Uh, we've got other parts of the economy, I think, where we're seeing inflation start to materially impact spending in some cohort, cohorts, some middle income earners and, and lower. Other parts of the economy, I think, are doing fine. All right, wealthy people who continue to spend money, they tend to spend the you know, you know, kind of a higher percentage of the overall dollar spent. So it's important, it's helpful. Companies are laying people off, but we're not seeing massive widespread layoffs either. I think the difference there is they're trimming the fat. They've not been digging into the muscle just yet. So um, that's encouraging as well uh, for uh, just for the people that, that aren't losing their jobs. So, like I said, it's a bit of a mixed bag on the on, on the economic data right now. There's not a lot to report in terms of expectations going forward. I don't see anything right now that's glaring that says we need to make a major shift in our investment strategies. To be clear, we're, we're adjusting those as we go along, okay, regularly. But I'm not seeing any kind of a major sea change or inflection point to where it, it, it warrants a, a massive shift. That being said, there's a lot of concern about one potential massive shift or what, what could happen if we were to go into a World War III type situation. I've been hearing from investors uh, a lot of concerns around just everything that's going on in the world right now. We've, we've, we've briefly discussed this in the past. I wanted to spend a little bit more time to address the question of what if, what if this turns into another World War type situation, a World War III? Now, we all can have opinions, and I could, I could tell you my geo, geopolitical analysis on what's going on in the world, and, 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 and I'll just have to tell you straight up, my analysis is no better than yours or anybody else's. We don't have access to that information. We're not sitting with Putin right now on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't understand what's going on in his head. Nobody does. So I think we need to accept the fact that nobody really knows what's going to happen. We can, we can estimate odds on something, you know, the odds that... Iran increases their conflict against Israel. I mean, they might, but are they going to go nuclear on them? Highly unlikely. But again, these are questions that you just don't know the answers to. So what, what I wanted to do this week, I wrote about this, was I wanted to say, okay, let's assume that we don't know what's going to happen. Let's assume that if one were to happen, okay, if we did fall into a kind of a World War type situation again, we haven't seen one in 70 years, what would that look like? So if I go back in history, what I did here was basically pulled out the last five major wars, okay? All right, so on the left-hand side, chronologically, World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam War, Gulf War, and Iraq War, okay? And then I compared it on the far right-hand side to your market returns over the last 98 years or so, I'll call it 100 years just for math. What I wanted to do was say, okay, in times of extreme war type situations, major wars. During major wars, has there been a consistency in markets along those along that way? And as you can look at the data here, the answer to that question is no. There is no consistency. Let's just use the oldest and the most recent war, the World War II on the far left hand side. 
During the World War II, the market ripped. Average annualized return of 20.5% during the war. Not only was the returns high, okay, when I say they're high, look at the far right-hand side. Market returns up over that century has been 10%. You're doubled your returns. More than doubled your return, average return over the last 100 years during World War II. That in of itself is a little surprising. What makes it even more surprising is look at the volatility. That's that orange bar. So during World War II, the average annualized volatility was about 10%. Compare that to the average over the long run of 17.1% on the right-hand side. So you're getting kind of the best of both worlds. You got phenomenal returns with a lot less volatility. That might be surprising. World War II was a terrible time for the world. It was awful. Yet, we, yet investors got paid really well. All right, flip it around to the Iraq War. Here, the returns are terrible. During that, it was about 6.8% a year. And the volatility shot through the roof, 21.5%. What gives? What's going on there? There's no consistency. But maybe there is. Maybe there is a consistency. Maybe the consistency across all of these wars is that they had no long-term impact on the stock market. Maybe that's the consistency. Think about it. Let's go back to the Iraq war. What was going on then? Well, that was sandwiched between two of the worst recessions in our country's history, the dot-com crisis and the financial crisis, okay? Think about it. Maybe, just maybe, the war had nothing to do with what was driving the stock market at the time. Go to World War II. World War II. Why did we see these types of returns and such less, lower volatility at a time when millions of people were dying? Well, if there's one lesson we've learned since 2020 is that when the government spends money, stocks go up and volatility falls. And back during World War II, we were spending some serious money as a country. Maybe that's the reason why. So my point here is very simple, is that you tend to see no consistency across wars because wars don't drive stock markets. So if we see another world war, World War III, I got to think that however long that would last, the same thing is going to happen. It's not going to drive the market. Now, that being said, we might see some near-term impact, right? All right, this is a, a, a little bit more of an extensive list of, 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 of war, wartime crises over the past couple decades, all right? And what you do tend to see is at the beginning of a crisis, at the beginning of a war, you do tend to see the market get hit, all right? Not surprising, all right? During 9-11, all right, the market's down 5% that day, um, the next day, rather. North Korea invades South Korea, again, back in the 50s, scary stuff. Pearl Harbor attack, awful, okay? So that one-day return tends to be pretty ugly, or it can be. Furthermore, you tend to see some drawdown in stock prices during that time. All right, the extreme example here, during Pearl Harbor, the market fell 20% from the time the attack happened to the bottom, all right? Took 142 days to get there. But, and this is a big but, look at the average one-year return after. All of these different events. With the exception of 9-11, we had phenomenal returns a year later. Why? Why would anybody want to, 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 to own stocks during, during something like after the Pearl Harbor attack or after a invasion of Kuwait? I'll tell you why. Crisis starts, people panic, they sell. They don't think about it, they just sell. All right, when they sell, what happens? Patient long-term investors look at their stocks going on sale and say, hey, wait a minute, I kind of want to own this. this. This stock just went on sale and I'm going to buy it. And then you see the market recover. Now, again, when I think about consistency, I see a very strong consistency, consistency here versus every other crisis ever that has happened in stock markets, ever. It has nothing to do with wars. All right, market, I'm sorry, investors panic, traders panic, they sell, they don't think about it, they get emotional, 
and the disciplined long-term investors come in to scoop up the shares at a discount. Why do you think Warren Buffett is worth a billion dollars, a couple hundred billion dollars at this point? That's why. So my point here is that wars are no different than any other crisis, like a Brexit or anything else. When they happen, people panic, they get irrational, they get emotional, and somebody else profits from that fear and panic. That's what I think will happen if we fall in another wartime situation. Because look, wars are nothing new. I mean, I hate them. I, I, I think everybody does. I mean, they're terrible situations. People die. You have to rebuild cities. A lot of money is spent. It's unnecessary, completely unnecessary. But ultimately, as you see on the screen here, going back 100 years, we've dealt with a lot of wars and a lot of battles and a lot of fighting. And through all that, the S&P 500 has averaged 10.8% a year. Think about that. More recently, an investment in 1970, a $10,000 investment of the S&P 500 in 1970 would be worth $2.6 million today. So I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't think anybody, anybody does, like I said, but let this data hopefully provide some level of comfort, comfort knowing that if, 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 if these geopolitical crises escalate, at least it doesn't look like the world will end. So with that, on that cherry note, have a great weekend and we'll talk soon.